Morning, everyone. Good morning, Chris. <laughs> Hello. So welcome. Welcome to this uh, soggy morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to our program today, Opioid Addiction and What Employers Need to Know. Just to give you a quick sense as to what you've gotten yourself into, uh, we've got a jam-packed session today, but Bob Duffy, our president and CEO, is going to offer some opening comments, uh, do some introductions. From there, we have County Executive Cheryl Denofa, who's going to offer some remarks. Then Jason DeLeo, from Meals by DeLeo, is going to talk a little bit about this issue from a personal employer perspective. We get into the heart of the order a little bit with uh, Dr. Mike Mendoza, who's going to share a presentation on how opioids are impacting our community due to Narcan training. Then Kim Hardy from Nixon Peabody is here to talk about some of the legal considerations employers should take into account. When and if we get through all that, we're then going to have some time, hopefully, for some questions and answers. One housekeeping item, the Narcan kits that uh, you're going to get today before you leave, your ticket for admission on that is in enrollment form. Please complete one of these. If you haven't brought one with you already, they're at the, uh, the desk on the way out. Hand that to us, and on your way out, you'll get one of the kits. So that's just the one housekeeping order. Again, thank you for coming today. Great information. I'd like to turn things over now to Bob Duffy. Uh, I'll start by I want to thank uh, Chris Weiss. Chris really has taken a leadership role putting us together. He's done a, a great job organizing uh, around the chamber. Uh, Kathy Richmond, our HR leader, cannot be here. Uh, she's not feeling well, but uh, I think Jen Stupé from her team and Mike Quinlan in the back. Mike was in charge of weather, I had to say that. But, uh, <laughs> they were very helpful in doing this as well in our events team. But I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, I go back to my first career. I, I've certainly been involved uh, in seeing people die from, from drug abuse and, and overdose and what have you. I've never, ever seen it like it is today, ever. Uh, it is absolutely horrendous to see the death toll that we have. Just recently, uh, we had a very good friend of the family. He lost his son, uh, college grad, working. Uh, I think it was in his early 30s, just passed away, just over the last six or eight weeks. It affects everybody. Uh, and so this training today is really important. We're so glad that you came and took time out of your, your schedule. I'm going to try and hit the, the highlights very quickly. Uh, Monroe County, I, looking at how counties respond, I don't think anyone could respond better than how Monroe County has, has done. I'm going to credit the county executive, Sheldon Off, is going to say a few words in a moment. Uh, Dr. Mike Mendoza, their team, I think they've been up front with this. Uh, even today to have us here uh, getting trained with Narcan and, and having the county executive uh, approved get, everybody getting a kit. It's like $140 per kit. Uh, she has arranged to have us all walk away with that uh, because you just don't know. And, and Dr. Mendoza will probably tell a story, but he can tell about somebody who went through a training and within a few days afterwards actually used a kit. So you just don't know what's going to happen. So uh, I want to personally thank the county executive for all that she has done taking a leadership role and ask Cheryl's an office to see if you would. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for this very important conversation. Um, before I begin, please join me in thanking Bob Duffy and Chris for uh, opening up the doors here at KeyBank and the KeyBank folks for letting us use their uh, great facility this morning. But certainly to thank Bob and his team for uh, standing up and saying, yes, you know, we are going to join together with everybody in this community uh, to combat this horrible epidemic. Uh, but it takes leadership and it takes people like Bob and his team to get the job done. So will you join me in thanking them for the good work that they did. Thank you, Dr. team. So it's an epidemic. It's a crisis. We all know it. And I'm looking out uh, into the room, and I know that many of you in this room from different walks of life. And it heartens me to know that we have people like you in our community who are standing up and know that it takes each and every one of us to get the job done. It speaks volumes about what's inside of you to say, yes, we're here to help and to join together as a community to address this epidemic. Now, we've all seen the numbers, 220 deaths in Monroe County last year. Um, you've read it in the paper. You've seen it on the news. But those aren't just numbers, and we all know that. Those are our loved ones. It could be a spouse. It could be a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter. Um, it could be a coworker, somebody on our street. And I believe, and I know you believe it too, that everybody in this community deserves the best opportunity to live a healthy, successful lifestyle. And we're all in it together. In Monroe County, um, it's all hands on deck. I want you to know that we meet monthly with the district attorney, the sheriff, Dr. Mendoza, our Office of Mental Health, and we talk about what is happening in this community. How are we going to use our resources? What are we seeing every single month? And what are we doing about it? 
Dr. Mendoza, he's a little shy and humble, and I know he's going to speak with us in a minute, but he is now becoming a national expert on this epidemic. Now, maybe you don't want to be a national uh, expert on this epidemic, but why is it important? Because people are looking at Monroe County. They're looking at Monroe County and what, do you, what are we doing leading the way on training? What are we doing leading the way on prevention and education? And Dr. Mendoza is taken under his wing, working with our health care providers to make sure that we are best addressing this crisis, make sure that we have treatment available for folks, not only inpatient and bed, in bed treatment, but aftercare, which is extremely important. It's extremely important. And before I turn it over to Dr. Mendoza, I also want to let you know that we are also taking uh, the lead in the opioid lawsuit. And a lot of people ask me, well, you know, why did you do that? It's not just because I'm 17 year practicing, used to be a 17 year practicing trial attorney, so I might like attorneys. But the real reason is, is because we all know that the manufacturers of the opioids, and these are the prescription medications, really did uh, help fuel the, the, the flames of this opioid addiction. We're living through that right now. Um, so we want to make sure that we do everything that we can, all hands on deck here in the county. The Narcan training, why is that so incredibly important? I'll tell you what, Dr. Mendoza trains law enforcement officials. He recently trained our lifeguards at uh, Ontario Beach Park. The week after he trained lifeguards at the, at the beach, you probably saw it on the news, one of our lifeguards was on duty and noticed two people going out into the water, saw that there was a situation that was developing, left her post, went to see what was going on, and one of the folks that she observed had an overdose. She was trained, and that person is still with us today. So it's important that as a community, we give people the best opportunity to succeed. And you're on the front lines, your employers, people come in and out of your businesses all the time. And to be trained on Narcan use and to understand why that's so important helps keep our people in Monroe County, our loved ones in Monroe County, gives them the best opportunity uh, to turn their lives around and become healthy again. And we're all in it together, I want you to know that. And I know you know that because you're here. So I want to say thank you uh, from a grateful county of Monroe for all that you're doing. Thank you for being here this morning. Again, it speaks volumes about Monroe County and its residents. But we all know that this is a county um, that has a bright future. And we will get the job done together, each and every one of us. So thank you for being here. Thanks again to Bob and the Chamber for hosting. Not here without the county executive, so I really appreciate her support. Before Dr. Mendoza comes up, we have a, a special guest. Jason DeLeo is here. He is a, a bit local businessman. I will make a little plug. Uh, meals by DeLeo. If you haven't tried it, try it. Uh, <laughs> prepares great, healthy meals. I've, I think I've had four so far. It's fan they're fantastic. But he has a little personal story to tell. He wants to sh share a little bit. And it's somebody who really could maybe put a little uh, emphasis and, and kind of create a maybe a mindset today before Dr. Mendoza comes up. So I want you to welcome. Jason DeLeo is here with his wife this morning, and again, a, a, a local uh, young man, local success story, has done a great thing, and, and again, uh, I'm going to plug his business because if you haven't tried it, hate to cook, uh, and have meals that are so healthy, and what he has done uh, in terms of uh, you know, his life and, and getting pointed in this direction is a fantastic story. So I want Jason to see it, make a few comments, and then we'll break Dr. Mendoza. Jason. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> My name is Jason DeLeo, um, uh, ex uh, drug addict. You know, <clears throat> I've had six back surgeries, and uh, so I started with uh, prescription drugs. And uh, I was on opiates for about 15 years, and uh, took uh, a lot of struggle, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, uh, dedication to from from my wife, from my family, from my support system to, that, that never gave up on me, that uh, they hung by me and uh, they saw something in me I, I couldn't see anymore. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's not easy, but uh, there's there's hope for people out there. Um, I've been, uh, I've got about four and a half years now. Um, and I can remember when, you know, I couldn't get, I couldn't get a day because Opiates to me were like taking a, a, a breath of air in the morning. Uh, you couldn't, you couldn't imagine not having it. You know, it was uh, it was just two words in your bones. Um, and I've been through it all. I've been through, you know, six inpatients, uh, seven years of outpatient, uh, Suboxone, uh, you name it. Uh, and 
discipline at everybody and everything. And uh, and it's, it's different today, but uh, you know what, what you guys are doing is important. Um, keep somebody alive uh, one more day to have one more chance because uh, people do people do change. People don't want to. You live in that dark hole. You live in that that, that dark place. You want to find a way out, and, and you just can't. And every time you try, you, you yourself defeat yourself. Um, but there's hope, and uh, there's a way out. And for me, uh, for <clears throat> you know, I've I've done a lot of things, overcome a lot of things. Uh, again, support system and, and family is uh, is everything. <clears throat> And now with my business, you know, I've had a, a catering business for about 17 years. Through a lot of that, uh, my father and everybody else kind of helped things together as I was always ripping and running, come back and try and get better. But, uh, you know, now that I have the opportunity, I try and, uh, you know, I, I hire a lot of addicts. Um, you know, obviously, nobody else hire a using addict. At least they you know it's using. <coughs> but you, you find them that, uh, you know, I happen to be in different places and, and I get the opportunity to to give them an opportunity, because it's hard to find opportunities out there. Um, and I can speak their language, and some of the guys in the kitchen uh, that have been clean, got some, some time under their belt. You know, you can speak their language, you can give, give them a little bit of hope. Uh, the truth is probably, I don't know, let's say in five years, we've seen, uh, we've seen 10 come, and there's, you know, there's three of us still hanging tough. That's, uh, it's the way it is. But you still give somebody else a shot. You never know what they're going to do later on. You don't know what you say or, or what, what matters now. Um, or rather, what's going to matter later. Um, so you just be there when you can. Uh, thanks for your time. I want to thank Jason for having the courage to come and say that. <laughs> he is an inspiration. Uh, he has a great story. Uh, is Kitchen is on Bernard Street, or right in the area where it needs to be. And you know, if he's a chamber member, we're going to go down and do a tour. If we do an event down the way, walk to join us at some point. We'll probably publicize that down the road. Uh, but I just think that what he has done, uh, the road he's traveled being here, just kind of puts everything in perspective. So I want to personally thank you for that. Now we have star of our show is Dr. Mike Mendoza, a county executive. Already kind of introduced him. Uh, I just would say he is a national expert. Uh, he is and so support of every effort here locally uh, to help educate people. And what impressed me the most, he addressed our health care planning team or some members of our uh, chamber health care planning team in a room today. And I think the meeting started at 8 o'clock in the morning. He, he gets there a little bit early, but he spent the previous hour and a half visiting patients. He has, he's a working doctor. He has patients not only the health commissioner of the county, he's a working doctor with patients and, and truly an immersed in a health care profession. So please welcome Dr. Mike Mendoza. Thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you, Jason, for your story. Um, every time I give this talk, it's uh, somewhat abstract because I'm talking to an audience of people, and I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who's gone through this, but uh, to know that there's somebody in the audience who can serve it as, as an example of um, the power of love and compassion and support that we all can provide as a community, I think, is, is absolutely amazing. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your words. And I want all of you to remember that um, Jason is... Uh, a person, not just a, a statistic. And we're here to talk about people. We're here to talk about how we can work together as uh, citizens of Monroe uh, to help each other out. Uh, if there's one message I can impart upon you today, it's that um, uh, this is a human crisis. You know, we're here to talk about people. And, you know, one of the greatest struggles that we face is the stigma around addiction and the stigma around uh, the people who are struggling through this illness. And uh, I want to you know, be the first person to tell you here as a physician, and Jason frankly already told you uh, as, as a peer, that, um, that the people who struggle through this, like any other illness, uh, deserve our love and our compassion and our support. And uh, there's just nothing more important that I can tell you than that. So for the next half hour, uh, I want to go through uh, a little bit, first talk, talk about the illness. Talk about addiction. Talk about uh, what is it that we're dealing with today. There's a lot of misconception about addiction, and I want to spend a few moments just sharing with you what is addiction and, and how did we get here. Talk a lot more about overdose and uh, the crisis. <coughs> so we're actually in an overdose crisis, not just an addiction crisis, but an overdose crisis. 
and we need all hands on deck to do everything we can to prevent overdoses because that is what's uh, contributing to the numbers and the, and the stories that we hear. We'll go through Narcan training. Uh, you all are going to go through a half hour training, but quite frankly this is training that can be done in five minutes. Uh, all you need is uh, five minutes of time. Uh, we've produced a video on our website, monroecounty.gov slash opioids. Uh, there's a video there on the, the nuts and bolts of what you'll, you'll see later on today. And then finally, I'm, uh, I'm going to send you home with some homework. Uh, you all represent the front line of our community. You're the backbone of what we do here in this community. And you all will touch more people in a day than I can do in a month. And so frankly, I, I need all of you uh, to spread the word. So thank you all for being here again. So the first point I want to make is that addiction is an illness. It's an illness of the brain. And when you have an illness of the brain, uh, by definition, you're not able to make good choices. You know, the choices that you would otherwise make are not possible for you. Um, and, it, and it's not that you could do better if you just woke up one day with a little bit of more motivation. Uh, a lot of people think that having addiction is some sort of a character flaw. The furthest from the truth. It's actually an illness. And I think of it uh, as an illness just like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure. Um, you know, you need support. We, you know, we'd love to prevent it if possible. But sometimes we know that's not possible, and that's the case often with addiction. It's an illness of the brain, and that's why I show pictures of the brain. These are PET scans of the human brain. The first picture is the picture of an individual who's not currently using drugs, not currently addicted to anything. Uh, and the yellow, you know, is essentially normal brain activity. The middle picture is the picture of an individual who has uh, an addiction to cocaine, uh, but even hasn't used cocaine for 10 days. So I want to point out a couple of things. One is that that brain is not normal. There's not the normal amount of brain activity in that individual, uh, even without uh, using cocaine for 10 days. And the second point I want to make is that that's the picture of addiction. So it's not a picture of cocaine. So if, if somebody was addicted to marijuana or alcohol or opioids, it would be the same picture. And so what we know is that um, addiction itself is the illness. And so we can't you know, solve the crisis by substituting one with another because the picture of addiction will still remain the same. The third picture is the picture of that same individual 90 days later, still not using cocaine, still struggling through addiction. Addiction doesn't go away just when you stop using because addiction is the disease. In the same way that hypertension doesn't go away just because I give you medication. Um, it is an illness that lasts, frankly, for a lifetime. And so when we think of people who are struggling and who are in recovery, um, recovery is that place that we need to work actively to keep people in. Uh, we don't think of people as just getting to recovery and then we can sort of let go on the gas and, and hope they do okay. We've got to continue to work with them to keep them in recovery. The other point I want to make is that that's 100 days. Uh, that's a long time in addiction uh, circles. And when you hear of stories in the media, on the news, where they say, oh, we just need detox beds, or oh, we need this, or, you know, these short-term solutions are not going to fix it. And that's proof. After 100 days, that person's still not well. There is no 100-day detox uh, program out there. You know, there are short-term detox programs and then long-term care. And long-term care is what we're going to need to pull people through that short-term crisis. So this is an illness just like any other illness, and you wouldn't judge a person who has cancer, and in the same way, we shouldn't be judging people who struggle through addiction. And as much as we want to, we'd love to prevent addiction. Uh, but the reality is that it's very hard to prevent. Uh, because when you think of what predicts uh, someone's chance of having uh, an addictive disorder, about 50 to 75% of it is genetic. Our predisposition to developing addiction is hard-coded into our bodies even uh, the day we're born. And so there's not much you can do to prevent that. Um, and unfortunately, there's no good way to know who among us might have that predisposition. The other part of the risk, about 25 to 50 percent of that risk, is environmental. And that's why it's so important that we work together as a community, because we want to do everything we can to, to modify those risks that can predict somebody uh, who might develop an addiction down the road. The most common risk is early exposure to, to some kind of addictive substance, be it uh, you know, e-cigarettes, vaping, tobacco, alcohol, those are sort of the gateway drugs, to use a, a term from before, that can put somebody at risk for having a more serious addiction down the road. And when we look ahead to the future of this crisis, as I see it, you know, this is a, a, a long-term situation that we're going to have to confront as a society. There are 116 million people in this country who struggle through chronic pain. 
That's more than the number of people with cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. And uh, when I think of that 116 million people, I, I worry as a physician because uh, they are all potentially at risk for addiction because they are all in some fashion uh, likely to get uh, opioid pain medications. And that is often the entry point for addiction. And uh, you know we need to do everything we can to prevent because we don't want to go through this crisis again. And it starts really close to home. So this is a survey that we do every two years in the health department. Uh, this is called the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It's uh, designed by the CDC. It's administered all, all across the country. And we ask students in our uh, districts here in Monroe County uh, a series of questions. And, and this uh, happens to be the questions around substance use. And uh, we ask these high school seniors across the entire community, in the past month, uh, did you use e-cigarettes, drink alcohol, binge drink, or use marijuana? And the different colors are the different years in high school. And as you can see, uh, you know, for <coughs> drinking alcohol, for example, 42% of high school seniors in this county reported drinking alcohol uh, at some point in the last month. Vaping, e-cigarettes, freshmen, 12% in the last month. Uh, and so I show these statistics not to imply that they're uh, having an illness with addiction, but simply to show that these are people at risk. These are people in our homes, uh, and when we think of what can we do, it starts, it starts at home. It starts in our families. It starts uh, around the dinner table when you have conversations at the end of the day. What happened at school? Well, tell me what's, you know, tell me what's going on at school. These aren't people who are addicted, but they are at risk. More at risk are the people on the right. So, you know, in the same survey, we asked people, did you use heroin ever? Have you ever used prescription drugs to get high? Have you ever used over-the-counter drugs to get high? And as you can see, the numbers are not small. Uh, for prescription drugs to get high, high school seniors, 12%. Ever. 12% of high school uh, seniors in our community have used prescription drugs to get high. Um, and again, you know, not going to say anything about them other than that they are more at risk. And again, we've got to do everything we can on a dinner table at home to, uh, to, to support these kids. The stories, as you know, are gut-wrenching. And you know, the average age of the overdose fatality in our community is 35 years old. So that's younger than many of us. And um, you know, when you think of the economic costs, you know, not that this is an economic problem, it's a human problem first. But the economic costs are not trivial. Direct medical costs, lost productivity, uh, all of the uh, secondary impacts on uh, family, society, accidents in the community, whatnot. Um, $120 billion a year in lost productivity alone uh, in the United States. Uh, and you know, when you think of addiction as an illness, uh, one in 10 children uh, in the United States lives with an adult who is struggling through addiction. And the vast majority of them are under the age of five. And so the impact of addiction is, in many ways, more far-reaching than heart disease and cancer. So it's surprising to many when I show this slide, because this is the picture of the prevalence of addiction for the past 15 or so years. And um, just broad strokes, you can see that the lines are basically flat. And this is surprising to many people, because when you open up the papers, it would seem like addiction is at, all, at an all-time high. Uh, but the reality is that it really isn't. In fact, addiction in general is about as common now as it was in 2002. And this is very surprising to many people, and it was surprising to me when I first saw it. Again, alcohol by far the most commonly abused uh, substance. Um, but pres prescription opioids and illicit drugs are in the mix here. And they're all you know, essentially as common now as they were uh, 15 years ago. And this is surprising to many people. The reason that this is uh, surprising is because uh, what we're dealing with right now is not an epidemic of addiction. Addiction is just as common now as it was before. What we're dealing with is an, a, an epidemic of overdose, an epidemic of overdose fatality. And that's why you're here today. Um, you're here to, to take part in how do we prevent the next overdose. Because we know that the more overdoses that happen, it's only a matter of time before one of them becomes fatal. And that's what we're dealing with today. So the overdose epidemic is the public health crisis. And that is the crisis, and it is uh, not unlike any other public health crisis that we've seen in the past, uh, we need to focus on prevention and we need to make sure that we're working on preventing those things that actually can make a difference. So how did we get here? So to understand how to prevent this, we have to understand a little bit of how we got here. And as a physician, I will say that we own this. Uh, as physicians, we prescribe the opioid pain medications that put us on this path. 
Um, but whoever you talk to, if they say, oh, it's simply this, it's just the doctor's fault, or oh, it's just the consumer advocates, you know, there is no simple uh, explanation. Um, it's a very complicated story, but I think it started in healthcare. It started in healthcare back when I was in training, and we were told that, um, you know, we need to do a better job talking to our patients, we need to do a better job listening to our patients, that is still true. But back then, the way that got translated was, um, you know, why don't we ask our patients, all of them, about pain? Because that's an easy way for us to listen to them and, and, and do something to respond to their concerns. So we asked everybody, and uh, we made it a vital sign. Just for perspective, there's nothing vital about pain. You know, we ask for blood pressure and heart rate and temperature. Those are vital signs. Those are signs that you're living. But there's nothing vital about pain. You can live a vital life in pain, and certainly uh, you can be uh, very healthy without it. So there's nothing important necessarily uh, about pain. But what it did, it did is it set up this, this sort of mentality that we had to do everything we could to get rid of pain. And um, we were provided incentives and, you know, we were told we were doing a good job if we did our, you know, you know re reduce the pain scores. Uh, and the manufacturers of opioids caught on. Huge market opportunity. So they produced stronger and stronger pain medications. Even until two or three years ago, they were still producing stronger and stronger pain medications. Uh, to the point that uh, they said that Oxycontin was not habit-forming. And we know now that that is a total lie. But there it was. And uh, we continued as a society to, you know, uh, to the point that in 2010, we prescribed enough opioid pain medications to medicate every adult in the United States around the clock for one month. That was the peak of opioid prescriptions uh, in this country. So the industry played a huge role, but that was 2010. And we didn't have an overdose ep epidemic in 2010, okay? It really only started several years ago. So what really happened was, in 2010, in medicine, we started to figure out that we needed to do something about this overprescription problem. So we started to pull back. But we didn't do enough about addiction. And so what happened was, people went from prescription opioids to street opioids, so heroin at the time. And then more recently, they switched from heroin to illicit fentanyl, also on the streets. Now, a few words about fentanyl. fentanyl Pure fentanyl is a medication that we prescribe in the hospital. It's um, you know quality controlled. Uh, it's produced in very controlled fashion. That's not the fentanyl that people are dying from on the streets. People are dying from fentanyl relatives, fentanyl analogs uh, on the street that are produced in labs in China and Mexico, smuggled across the border. That is the poison that people are dying from today. And so when I say fentanyl, I refer to the fentanyl analogs that uh, are being made uh, abroad. And so this is the picture of what I just described. So the purple line, so the, the green line is death from all opioids. Uh, going back to 2000 through 2015, purple is death from prescription opioids. As you can see in 2010, it started to taper off roughly when we started to do, uh, prescribe less. At the same time, that's when heroin started to spike. Um, heroin, generally speaking, is safer than fentanyl, <coughs> if you will. Because fentanyl came along in 2013 or 12, and that's when the epidemic really began, both here in Monroe County as well as across the country. And if I were to show you these data in 2017 and 18, orange would be through the literally through the roof because the number is 22, and right now that graph goes up to 11. So fentanyl is the scourge that is causing the epidemic of uh, today. And this is why. This is the picture of a lethal dose of heroin compared to fentanyl. Uh, and by design, you can't see the fentanyl in the back of the room because it doesn't take much. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to guess that most of our drug dealers are not highly trained in chemistry. And so what we're essentially doing is putting the lives of our loved ones in the hands of people who really don't know what they're doing, other than knowing that they're putting fentanyl on the streets. And that's why, you know, as I see it, they need to be brought to justice. But that is the lethal amount of fentanyl and um, that doesn't take very much. So people are getting fentanyl now mixed into a whole bunch of things, because it's really hard to buy fentanyl straight. So you, it's fentanyl mixed with cocaine, fentanyl mixed with heroin, fentanyl mixed with what have you, marijuana, uh, and that's what's killing people in our community today. And so just to put this in perspective, it's no longer uh, a prescription problem, okay? We will do everything we can to reduce overprescription. We don't want to go too far, because people who are in chronic pain should be treated. Um, but we have to definitely make sure that we're focusing on the right things. And if all we do is focus on the prescription rate for opioids, we're not going to make a difference. 
So this is what I've shown you here is uh, I took all the counties in New York State and I looked at their opioid prescribing rate per capita. And that's the orange bar. So the highest opioid prescription rate per capita is in Sullivan County. The lowest prescription uh, opioid rate per capita is in Kings County. Okay, and it's sort of ranked by county, high to low. Monroe County is uh, down there toward the bottom quarter. The blue bars are the corresponding fatality rate from opioid, uh, opioids in that county. So if it was purely a prescription opioid problem, you ought to see the tallest bar on the left where the highest rate is and the shortest on the right. And in fact, there's, that's not the case. In fact, there's no correlation anymore between uh, opioid prescription rate and fatality. Okay, so if all we do is focus on opioid prescription, we're not going to hit the mark in terms of preventing this crisis. So we've got to keep working on this. You know, as physicians, I need to keep working on this. But as a community, we can't just focus on this because this won't get us to the goal. And this is a regional problem. A lot of people think that this is a Monroe County problem, it's a city problem, but the fact of the matter is that there are counties around us that have a higher rate of uh, uh, opioid-related uh, uh, visits and, and ER visits and what have you than, than Monroe. And I'm not trying to pick on other counties, I'm just trying to say that this is a regional crisis. And a national crisis. So this is what has happened to life expectancy in the United States. In the last two years consecutively, life expectancy has gone down shouldn't go down. It should only go up. The last time it went down at all was in 1993, which was due to the HIV and AIDS epidemic. The last time it went down two years in a row at all was in the 1960s, and I'm not sure we know why. But um, when people die at the rates that they are, at an average age of 35, that is what brings down life expectancy uh, anywhere. And so that is, that is what we're dealing with now. Every expert has weighed in on this, and the reason for this decline is the opioid epidemic. And this is the epidemic, okay? This is the, the picture I want you to see in contrast to addiction over the years. Where addiction was constant for the last 15 years, this is anything but, okay? And as you can see, we were looking at single-digit numbers here in Monroe County as recently as 2011. And as the county executive mentioned last year, 220 lives lost. So how do we prevent this? So in contrast to addiction, where genetics and the environment are what we need to try to prevent, when it comes to overdose, we've got to focus on very different things. First of all, we've got to you know, work with our partners across the community to try to, to change this paradigm of mixing fentanyl with other things. Because fentanyl was involved in 90% of the fatalities here in Monroe County, 90%. Whenever anybody uses a loan, that puts them at risk, because if they have an overdose, they're not likely to have help on the way. So that's, why, uh, that's where you come in. So we want people to be around to help these individuals in the event that they experience an overdose. The scariest part among the medical community is the third point, loss of tolerance after abstinence. What that means is we can get somebody clean, quote unquote clean, uh, from drugs, get them uh, no longer intoxicated through a detox or a stabilization of some kind, but they lose their tolerance in the process, which means that whatever they were able to use before after detox may actually kill them because they don't have that tolerance that they lost when they were in detox, which underscores the importance that we can't stop at just detox. We need to have that system that pulls people through into long-term care and recovery. Uh, and then the finally, you know, when, when you know, users switch from one source to another, it's simply because you don't know what you're getting and dealers are not going to be upfront with you necessarily. So you, you're going to get a kit of Narcan today, and uh, this is uh, as, as sciencey as I'm going to get. Uh, opioids are the little green balls, okay? So if you've got a whole bunch of opioids in your body, they're going to try to saturate all the yellow receptors. So these are opioid receptors that are in our brain. When the opioid touches that receptor, it tells the brain to do all the things that opioids would do. Pain control, nausea, etc. But the other point is that when the opioids are on those receptors, all the side effects happen. And the, the primary side effect that we care about is that opioids uh, cause people to stop breathing. And obviously that's not a good thing. So what Narcan does is it moves that opioid uh, molecule off of that receptor and replaces it with Narcan. That essentially turns off the light switch and it tells the body no longer to do all the things that opioids do, and thereby reducing that side effect of uh, affecting your breathing. That gives that person a chance to want to breathe again and hopefully take them through this crisis. 
So that's what you're going to get in your Narcan kit uh, today. Narcan only works in this way. So if somebody's overdosing from cocaine or alcohol or something else, Narcan won't do anything. Uh, if you give Narcan to somebody who's not overdosing from anything, it will do nothing. It's 100% uh, safe in that way. So it's an antagonist, it's an antidote, if you will, to opioids. It takes about two to five minutes to work, so not very long. Um, I want you to remember two to five minutes because when we talk about how you give Narcan, the key is to wait two to five minutes to see if they're breathing again. And if they're not breathing again, it means that they need more. Okay? It lasts 30 to 90 minutes. There's a lot of variation there. The hope is that by 30 minutes, you're going to have additional help along the way. But it can last from 30 to 90 minutes. It doesn't last forever. <coughs> because these opioids are designed sometimes, and you don't know what the person's taken, but some of them will last half a day. Okay, so when you revive somebody, the key is to get them to a hospital because they're going to get put on an Narcan drip uh, IV if ne uh, necessary. Uh, Narcan has no effect uh, and causes no harm to an individual who is not suffering from, uh, from an opioid overdose. Okay, totally inert. Um, and it can be given by any route, many routes. The most common, as you'll see, is the spray, and that's what you're going to get today. Really common question is how do I store it? Now, all drugs manufactured in this country are going to basically say something generic like that. But the reality is, uh, this is first aid. So think of it as first aid. Um, you want to keep it where it's accessible. Uh, so if it's at home in the medicine cabinet and you've got people at home, that's great. But if your house is empty most of the day, having Narcan at home is probably not the best place to have it. So I think most people will find it in their car, briefcase, purse, backpack, whatever. Have it with you because that's where you'll most likely be able to access it in the event that you need it. Um, the bit about room temperature is, you know, important but not critical, which means that in uh, Monroe County you can keep it in your car. Uh, if it gets hot in the summertime, it's probably still going to work. That's still much better than having it at home when you know, nobody's there to get it. Uh, if it's frozen, it will not work, but you can thaw it quickly by putting it in your hand or bringing it inside. So keep it where it's at the ready. So how do you identify somebody who's struggling from an overdose? So the first thing you're going to look at is their pupils, their eyes. Okay, normally our pupils are four to five millimeters, four to five millimeters. Uh, in a person who's suffering from an overdose, it'll be one to two millimeters. It'll be tiny. Um, there are very few things uh, available today that can cause that outside of, uh, of opioids. So that'll be the first thing you look for. Um, second, you want to look at their breathing. Uh, the best way to assess for breathing is to put your ear along their face, feel, try to feel the air on your face, and look down toward their toes and hope to see their chest. Uh, rising and falling. Okay, that's how you assess for breathing. Uh, if you don't see either of those, odds are they're not breathing. You may see signs of uh, uh, blue or purple lips, fingernails, pale skin. That's a sign that they haven't been breathing for a while. And then, uh, obviously, if they're unconscious, then that's a serious concern. So when you come up on a person who looks like this, the first thing you do is confirm that they're unresponsive. The uh, best way to do that is to take your knuckles and rub them on that person's breastbone. That's very, very painful. It will arouse anybody who can be aroused. If they are not arousable, your next step is to call 911. Because for all that I'm going to tell you about Narcan, the most common reason to find somebody in this situation is a heart attack. And odds are we can't manage a heart attack by ourselves uh, without help. So you want help along the way. In the event of an opioid overdose, you want somebody on the way who can bring more Narcan. Because in each of these sprays, and you're going to get two of these in your kit, in each of these sprays, you have two sprays. So remember, you're going to do this every two to five minutes. So this will give you 10 minutes, and the second one will give you an additional 10 minutes. So you're going to get about 20 minutes of uh, a head start, so to speak, for help is on the way. Most people will need more than a box of Narcan to survive. And you know what I'm doing today is giving you, uh, you know, 20 minutes worth to give that person a head start so that we can buy the time for EMS to arrive and take over. So, when you see somebody down, you take your Narcan. Um, I would leave it sealed like this. You can open up the box that I gave you later on today. But leave it sealed like this. You're going to open it by peeling off the back. And as you can see, it's essentially, you hold it like this. And with your thumb, you just push the plunger and spray. Spray one into one nostril. And you wait two to five minutes. And then if they're not breathing, you do it again. Other nostrils, you know, switching nostrils is ideal. And you keep doing this every two to five minutes, frankly every two to three minutes, until help arrives or until they start, uh, start breathing. 
Once they start breathing, you can sit back, keep this ready, because they may fall back into overdose. Um, but you want to sit there and, and, and stay with that person until help arrives. Keep them safe. You want to put them in the rescue position, which looks like that. The reason for that position is because um, when they come to, often they'll be nauseous and may vomit. And you don't want them to vomit in, you want them to vomit out, and so that's why you have them on their side. And you put their knee out like that so that you uh, can prevent them from rolling onto their face, which is also a problem. So that's the general recovery position for uh, whatever it is uh, that you want to put them into. <coughs> Um, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, is it, it's true that they'll, they're going to be, when they do come to, they're going to be in complete withdrawal, correct? They may be. That's a, they will be in withdrawal. The question is, is it mild or severe? If I give them 10 of these all at once, we'll put them into severe withdrawal, probably, if we're going to bring them back at all, and they will be a little worse off. I mean, they will be very uncomfortable, very confused. Uh, we don't want to get to that point. So that's why every two to five minutes is ideal. We just want to sort of ease them into withdrawal, so to speak. Um, withdrawal is an awful feeling, by the way. That's the reason why people keep using is to stay out of withdrawal. It's not because they get high. It's, it's they want to stay out of withdrawal. It's an awful feeling, but that's a much better feeling than not breathing. Right? So, yes, that's a good question. How many sprays are in each? How many, how many times can you spray with one, one kit? With one of these... You're going to get two of these. With one of these, you get about two, two sprays. So you'll get about four sprays per kit. And you have two of these per kit. How long are they applied? About 30 to 90 minutes. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. If you're going to store, you were talking about storage. Ah, yes. For, for a year, is it two? How long? Is so there, are, like all medications, there's an expiration date. So I think the expiration date for the ones you're going to get today is November 2019. So not very long, OK? Um, I shouldn't tell you this, but uh, stuff still works after the expiration date. <laughs> you all have Tylenol at home, and it's like 1994. Um, um, so ideally, when it expires, call us. We'll replace it. Okay, But don't throw it away just because it's expired, because it will likely still work. Uh, expired Narcan is better than none, but frankly, get, get, get up-to-date Narcan. There's no reason not to, and we'll talk about other ways that you can get it, but, uh, but really important. like nasal spray, but unlike nasal spray, now this question comes up a lot, that it's absorbed differently, so it's not like when you, when you take a nasal spray and then you get your head back and trying to get it all the way in, um, it's, it's far different, so yeah. don't, don't worry about that. Good point. So, so by definition, you don't have to be breathing to use this. It's not like Flonase or Albuterol, where Albuterol has to be inhaled into the lungs, <coughs> and this has to be sort of slurped up a little bit. This just needs to sort of percolate in the upper airways of your nose. So. You don't need to be breathing, you won't be breathing if you're using this. Um, and it just needs to sit there on your nose. So, good point. Um, you earlier slide said something about rescue breathing. How are you doing the rescue breathing and recovery? So, <coughs> yeah, so in the two to five minutes that you're waiting, that's an eternity. So, if you know how to do rescue breathing and CPR, do it then. Okay, so you do, uh, you know, spray, rescue breathe if you can, do CPR if needed. So, if CPR, if they don't have a pulse, right? But rescue breathing otherwise, and do that while you're waiting that two to five minutes, and then uh, give them another spray. And so that's sort of the routine until help arrives. But the key is calling 911 because uh, it will be an even longer eternity if help doesn't arrive. So you want help on the way. So we'll take more questions later. Um, real quick, and I know we're going to have an expert on this, so you don't really want to take legal advice from a doctor generally, but um, <laughs> this is first aid. This is considered first aid in New York State, so I want you to think of it in that way. Um, it should be like an AED kit or, or, or uh, any kind of uh, first aid in, in New York State. You're, you're um, not going to incur any personal liability from having this, from using it, from using it incorrectly, whatever that looks like. Uh, but we'll hear more from the experts later on. So finally, I want you all to go home knowing that there is a lot going on in this county. And uh, no, I don't like to brag, but I do think that we are at the head of the curve on this. Um, and I was at a conference in New Orleans, and I had people come to me who heard, the best was that I was in the hallway, and some lady was saying, hey, I heard about this guy from Monroe County, he's doing this really good stuff. And he, she looked at me and said, hey, have you met him? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> but there's a lot of good work happening in this county, and I, and I think it, it doesn't do us any good to uh, 
adopt the mentality that I think we keep hearing, which is that we need more beds and we need more capacity. That's all true, but we got to know that there's good stuff happening here. So your homework is to take this message uh, home with you and uh, raise your awareness. Talk about this at home. It's not an easy conversation. Do everything you can to eliminate the stigma around addiction. Um, go into your medicine cabinets. Get rid of unused medications, whether it's a cholesterol medication or an opioid. If it's not being used, it is not safe. Spread the word about Narcan, about training. We've got a video online, four minutes, that you can learn the basics of how to use Narcan. Um, we do training at the health department uh, every month. We've got two classes. Uh, just sign up at our website. Anybody in this community can go to any pharmacy and pick this up without a prescription. Okay? There is a standing prescription available across the, the state where you can walk in and get Narcan. And essentially, it'll be free of charge because if you have insurance, there's a program that allows the uh, pharmacy to bill the state for up to $40 of any copay that you might you know, be responsible for which means that most of the time our co-pays are less than 40 bucks, you can walk out with this free of charge. Um, go to the website, learn more about it. We've got a lot about the programs that are available. We're trying to do everything we can to educate people about the long-term uh, history of, of what we're dealing with here. Uh, and most importantly, if you, you or, or somebody you love is struggling through this crisis, remember it's an illness. Uh, they deserve love, compassion, and support. Uh, and together, I think, uh, you know, your being here today is, is really a first step, and I hope that uh, there are many more steps to come. So thank you all for your time, and uh, we'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lennon, uh, we have one more speaker. I want to invite Kim Hardy. She's an attorney at Nixon Peabody, has expertise in labor, employment, counseling, uh, and I think the doctor mentioned in a society of litigation, great Great steps, really great advice. So uh, once Kim finishes, I'm have Chris, Chris is going to moderate some discussion and questions, and then uh, again, it's a great program so far. So please welcome Kim Hardy. Good morning. Uh, thank you to Dr. Mendoza and to the chamber. This is, I'm like riveted. I don't even know how I can follow that. Um, but like Dr. Mendoza said, this is first and foremost a, a human crisis, but as we as employers know, we also have uh, to manage this crisis in the workplace. So I will condone his very excellent legal advice on uh, the Good Samaritan law. There's no liability if we administer Narcan, uh, even incorrectly. So certainly that's a first step in how we can be deploying our own resources or what we can be doing. I'm going to try and give some other tips on managing the opioid crisis in the workplace um, and some legal loopholes or tricks and tips. So, um, As a starting place, we know, like I said, it's a human crisis, but it's also an economic crisis. We have lost productivity, costs for rehab, treatment, um, medical insurance costs. Costs to employers also include unscheduled absences when someone's dealing with addiction or a substance abuse problem in the home. Unexpectedly, we can be paying to, to cover staff, um, sometimes at time and a half or double time. Uh, can cause Opioids have been causing accidents both on the streets but also in the workplace. This increases our workers' comp costs. This in, uh, leads to OSHA liability and also damaged equipment or other injuries. The workers' comp issue is very interesting as well because many people start using prescription pain medication to manage accidents or injuries that they incurred in the workplace. So that's uh, a unique employer wrinkle that we'll talk a little bit more. There's also other, other impacts to employers such as criminal activity in the workplace um, or I think the biggest piece for us is so many of our peers, our friends, our loved ones are either affected themselves at work or they are dealing with this crisis and trying to work while having so much on their mind that you know, they're not, no longer the productive employees that we had always known, um, but really struggling. I can think of any number of people who have this at the top of mind every day, whether they're an addict themselves or really trying to support an addict or worrying about whether they're, they're going to come home to something terrible. So. Um, from I'm going to be a little bit, I don't want to say cynical, but at, there's a um, kind of a heartless approach that sometimes we have to take as, empo as employers. So I want to try and emphasize that there's so much we can do as the, as the front lines. We're 
we have a, the ability to deploy resources or training or awareness to all of our folks, but all, on the flip side, we want to kind of give you the tools to understand what this looks like in the workplace. So um, the first thing to understand is that managing op opioid users in the workplace is going to largely depend on whether the user or the employee is, is considered disabled under the excuse me, under the disabilities rights laws. So first, remember that those with disabilities who may be taking opioids lawfully, pursuant to a prescription, um, they're, they're likely considered disabled under the Americans with Disabilities Act or the New York Human Rights Law. And so we have a, an obligation under the law to accommodate them. And sometimes that, some, many times, it, if we look at the, the rates of prescription medication, we probably don't even know when a lot of people are, are addicted or taking this pain medication, so that's pretty easy accommodation, but there may be other um, accommodations we would have to make, like a modified work schedule or perhaps a leave of absence. And I'll talk again a little bit about that in a second. So the other piece to remember is that a recovering or a recovered addict under the law is also considered disabled. So as we talked about, you know, hiring addicts, things like that, we cannot deny employment to those who are, who are in recovery. They're um, entitled to the accommodation so long as they can perform the essential functions of their job. We have a legal right to employ them. So um, let's as we manage this crisis and try to bring these folks back into the workforce, we want to make sure that we get rid of that stigma and return them. Um, the, the piece to remember if you're like, oh, scared about that, or I don't know, we shouldn't be, we should be kind of doing our best, but there's no obligation to hire or accommodate current illegal drug users. And so an illegal drug user can be someone who's either not medically taking pain or prescription medication or abusing opioids or taking something without a prescription. So to the extent that there would be a detrimental effect on the workforce, we don't have an obligation to accommodate them. The um, ADA also allows employers to prohibit the use of alcohol or illegal drugs in the workplace. And again, illegal means includes the abuse of op opioids or uh, going beyond the prescription. Um, also allows us to prohibit employees from being under the influence at work. And we can hold employees who engage in illegal drug use to the same standards as all other employees, um, even if the performance is related to drug use. So the example I would use here is really if an em you, know, you have an employee who has an attendance issue, they miss 11 days of work in 15 days, and you say this is a this is an issue, we're going to terminate your employment, and an employee says, well, but, I, but I'm an addict. We don't have an obligation to treat them differently in that moment. It's not an excuse for poor behavior. The flip side is if an employee, if an employee voluntarily comes to you and says, I'm struggling, I think I have a problem, I'm not sure what to do, Though one, what a great opportunity, and two, that we really do have an obligation under the law to try and accommodate this person the best that we can. So maybe that's a modified work schedule to go to meetings or get treatment. Maybe that's you know doctor's appointments. Maybe that's a leave of absence to go to a treatment program. These are all, it's gonna be an individualized process in, in each assessment, um, but we wanna engage in the interactive process just as if someone, again, told us that they had cancer or, um, any other disease or condition. Keep in mind as well that under the FMLA, substance abuse or substance dependence is considered a serious health condition, so entitles employees to protected leaves of absence for up to 12 weeks, assuming that they otherwise qualify. Oh, and the piece there uh, also is, remember the FMLA protects not only the employee, him or herself, but if they have a family member who's struggling with substance abuse, also would be entitled to 12 weeks under the FMLA. I uh, just had an employer with this issue this week, so it's certainly happening all across the board. And, and I said, well, my son has severe anxiety and a substance abuse problem, and I was like, F just give him FMLA right now. <laughs> um, but that's certainly a tool that we can use. It, it allows people to spend time with their loved ones, monitor their loved ones, um, and you can, I know that the FMLA is often uh, a thorn in a lot of employers' sides, but consider whether you would rather have an employee just take a 12-week leave of absence to get someone the treatment that they need, or whether you'd require that the employee be distracted and unproductive at work for 12 weeks. What, you know, 
where, where's the true value there? So if they can come back in 12 weeks feeling engaged, like they're supported, like you want, they want, you want them there and part of the workforce and you care about them and their loved ones, they're probably going to be a, a lot more appreciative, thankful, and productive at the end of those 12 weeks. So it's a small sacrifice. Um, with, res with respect to medical inquiries, we want to remember that, again, opioids, particularly the prescription pain medication, are perfectly lawful if used if using um, accordance with the doctor's prescription. So we want to avoid med you know, requiring everyone to disclose which prescription pain medications they might be on. I feel like I don't have to tell a room of employers that because every time I say, well, you could ask this question, like, we can't ask anything about their medical, it, no medical inquiries. I'm like, okay, that's true. Um, there's always a resistance to, under, to knowing anything. Um, we can, however, require employees in safety-sensitive positions to disclose what prescriptions they're taking. Those people operating heavy machinery or who you know drive for for a living, if they're going to be in a position that we that we may have some concern as to whether they could be abusing um, their medis their medications, we would be satisfying the job-related inquiry uh, element of the ADA. So consider which jobs we we consider safety sensitive, or what the essential functions of each position are, and whether the employee could law or could safely do that job. Don't assume that the employee can't simply can't do their job simply because they're on a pain medication or taking uh, opioids or other pain management medication. Um, again, it's always an individualized inquiry under the ADA. So. We have to engage in the interactive process, do an individualized assessment, um, and also be sure that our drug policy don't include blanket prohibitions on the use of drugs at work, or especially opioids, this is going to be a per se ADA violation. We want to make sure we're reviewing our, our drug abuse policies, because if you're taking an opioid pursuant to a lawful prescription, again, we would, not, we would be discriminating against someone with a disability. So we also have the ability to do drug testing in the workplace, right? So this is one way to manage, this is one way to, to know um, if an employee is under the influence at work. And New York has no laws regulating drug testing for private employers. So this is a really important tool for employers, not only to keep their workforces safe, but also possibly to identify those who may be at, at risk for addiction um, or overdose. So the, this gets tricky, though, in, the, in light of the opioid crisis, because first, uh, if someone has a lawful prescription for pain medication, and if you're using a medical review officer to conduct your drug tests, like you should be, highly encouraged, and don't know how you do it without them, but um, the medical review officer will have, will administer the test, if it comes back positive, they'll offer the employee a chance to provide an explanation. And if you're not using an MRO, this would also be the process that you use. And if the employee says, yes, I have this prescription, um, then we would have an, an obligation to accommodate that, or the MRO would say, okay, this is a clean test. And so we, it, it's not necessarily going to pick up a lot of the drugs that are in the workforce right now, or identify those who we really are perhaps the most concerned about. Um, the other piece is that this is a only a yes-no test, right? So if they uh, have a lawful prescription, we have no ability to know whether they're using it lawfully or whether they're abusing it or, you know, if the doctor's <coughs> prescribing two pills a day and they're taking four or whatever the case may be. It's just a yes or no. So if that test comes back clean, we don't have a, a quantitative assessment to say, oh, this is beyond their prescribed use. Um, so when we look at our drug testing policies, we also want to make sure that we're including uh, behavior and performance assessments that a layperson can do to, to say it's not just the failed drug tests that might subject you either to uh, discipline or um, an interactive process about an accommodation. We want to have these, these layperson assessments and not solely be relying on the drug test. The other reason, and I'm, I'm not the medical expert, so we have the medical expert giving legal advice, the legal expert giving medical advice. Um, <laughs> it's just a real team approach here today. 
Um, but as far as I understand, a typical five panel drug test that most em employers would administer are not going to pick up most of the pain management medications in the workplace. So if you're concerned about opioid addiction in your workplace, you need to make sure that you're using a more enhanced screen. And I see Dr. Mendoza nodding his head, which makes me feel very vindicated. Um, so, you know, drugs like Oxy or Hydros, anything, um, you know, that, that's really created this crisis is not going to get picked up on a drug screen. And in some ways, from an ADA perspective, that's great, right? Because we don't know about it. We don't have a stigma against these employees who are entitled to accommodations under the law, the ability to take that medication. But if we're looking for people who are, might be at risk, um, we, we, we may want to be picking that up. Or for those who are using it non-medically uh, because of the availability on the streets or whatever the case may be, we need to be sure that we are using drug, pa drug panels that screen for synthetic and semi-synthetic opioids. So if you're using the five panel, you're only going to pick up the heroin, codeine, and fentanyl. Uh, we want to be picking up the oxycodone, methadone, synthetic fentanyl, etc. So what happens when you get a, assume, assume you get the good, the good drug screen, right? The enhanced panel, you're picking up everything, you have an employee and they text, test positive for for oxy or um, any other opioid, most of us in that instance, and again, assume they don't have a lawful prescription. Most of us in that instance, our drug policies are zero tolerance. So once you test positive, you're out the door. And one thing we really need to consider as, as employers in this crisis is whether we want to continue to be zero tolerance workplaces. I agree there are costs to having uh, addicts or users in the workplace. We don't want people working under the influence. These are certainly, uh, cre can create costs to the employer. But on the flip side, if we have a zero tolerance workplace where as soon as someone is discovered to, oh no, be an addict, uh, and they're out the door, are they gonna voluntarily ever come forward to tell us that? If we have this stigma, if we have um, this, if we create this environment where people are afraid to lose their jobs for fear of testing positive or um, or getting treatment, we may not be creating the environment where we can actually get people help. So, you know, I'm like a kumbaya lawyer sometimes where I'm always like, we need to help everyone. Um, and it doesn't necessarily jive with my corporate lawyer personality as well. Um, but, you know, think about the role that you can play and you can you perhaps be using a, or having a drug testing policy that can I more be used more as a tool of identification and then say, this person is non-medically using opioids, let's offer them a chance for treatment and rehab or a leave of absence or, or send, have, accommodate their schedule so that they can attend uh, meetings or whatever the case may be. And then you know, maybe bring them back to work after they complete a treatment program on even a last chance agreement if you wanted to provide more protection for yourself as the employer. We have ways that we can protect ourselves, but also still create an environment where perhaps people know that they might have a second chance or that there's help out there. Someone had a question. If you offer that to one employee, do you have to offer it to all employees? Uh, have to? No. Um, certainly not. I think every situation is different. We want to avoid, um, you know, if you have a very high performing employee or someone in a key position or something like that, we want to, we would use those factors to distinguish between everyone. Um, we want to get into issues of age or race or sex, you know, uh, just the same as we would when we do individualized treatment of any employee, but it doesn't have to be an across the board. You can certainly do a case by case determination. And I almost think depending you know, on whether they're entitled to an accommodation, you would have to. So um, consider whether, whether someone might be deserving of another opportunity or whether we can modify our policies to say, if, if, if you fail the drug tests, we're going we're gonna to offer you these treatment options. Now, uh, another one of my clients was like, we really want to get people into treatment. We want to, you know, but, you know, treatment's expensive. <laughs> I was like, yes, that's true. It really is. It's a, it's a, it's a cost for insurers. It's a cost. It's a medical expense. Um, but again, can can we return this person productively to the workforce? Can we show our other employees that we that we care about those in our environment? You know, it's likely that if anyone in the workforce knows that this person is an addict, they're also distracted and worried and going to Narcan training or doing whatever the 
case may be. So there's there's costs either way. So I'd encourage you to try and get deploy these resources to your employees um, because they're a countervailing cost. Absolutely, yeah. Um, <clears throat> what about a faith-based rehab? Mm -hmm. How's it if you offer that to an employee? Is there any? No, is I mean as long as you don't require you don't require it, I would offer it as, many, as one of many options. You're saying is that like a religious discrimination? Yeah, there's just a, a place that I know that I sent, you know, I, I bring some yeah. people, a uh, place I went to, and they're, uh, it's like $750 for the year. Yep, that's great. So, so it's a long-term program. Um, it's not a lot of fun. I've been to really nice ones. I've been to this one. Um, this one just happened to be the one that I got, you know, I yep. got sober at. So I didn't know if you can offer that, but I mean. Certainly. There's no, okay. there's no, um. Any treatment op option that you're offering your employee is really a good one, I think. Um, as many as you can offer, whichever ones, you can't necessarily force someone to go. Um, it, on the flip side, if they said they wanted to attend a faith-based uh, addiction recovery program and you said no because it was faith-based, there could be a religious discrimination element on that. But if it's you making the suggestion, I think that would be fine. We want to not deny based on certain religions. Um, so anyway, what are uh, the takeaways here? If we if we want to, to test, if we're going to test, we want to consider if we want to do an enhanced screen. Uh, remember that we can test pre-employment, but only after we provide a job offer. Um, and then we can test upon reasonable suspicion. And again, that can include uh, behavior performance issues, um, an unusual activity, spot, if we can spot the warning signs of abuse or addiction. It can all, we can also test post-accident if we have reasonable suspicion. This is a little bit of a gray area right now because of OSHA's rules saying that we can't deter employees from, from reporting accidents and does a drug test to deter people from reporting. If we have other indicia that, that the person was under the influence, we can certainly drug test post-accident. We can also randomly drug test safety sensitive positions. Um, we want to, so we want when to test in our policies. We want to carve out the legal use of opioids, um, but include that the use of legal drugs constitutes illegal use. Include measures that a layperson can use to constitute reasonable, so reasonable suspicion. We want to reconsider our zero tolerance policies. We want to require disclosure if the person works in a safety sensitive position. We want to consider the essential functions of every job so we know which accommodations we can make and when. Um, we also want to make sure that we're training our managers. Training our managers on our policies, when they can test, what the warning signs are, um, that they need to be documenting behavior and performance, but importantly, what resources are available to employees? What Work with your insurance plans, understand what is covered, what we can offer to employees. Do you have an employee assistance program? Do you have treatment options available? And can we, you know, we're talking about how the managers are on the front lines, but the, you know, we have, or the employers are on the front lines, but it's our managers who are really day to day interacting with your staff, and how can we educate them to create, you know, an environment where people are coming forward. Also talk to your insurers to understand what alternative pain management options might be available and how they're deploying them and how they're perhaps uh, managing this crisis themselves, especially workers' comp insurers like we talked about. If people are getting addicted to pain management medication due to workplace in injuries, then they, they probably have a, a much better grasp on kind of what's going on and, and have better control on how to maybe manage addiction in the workplace. We want to destigmatize um, also our employee assistance programs. I think even my workplace is guilty of this. We all think that, oh no, don't call the EAP or, you know, ha ha. But these are really, really effective programs. Um, and we want to destigmatize the use of them and, so that we can also destigmatize addiction and perhaps prevent overdose. That'll cover it. Wonderful. Thank you.
Thanks, Ken. Oh, Some yeah. very happy, or very happy, very helpful advice from a legal perspective. I'm a little confused as to whether I should be asking Dr. Mendoza now for legal advice or <laughs> <your> medical <laughs> advice, but we'll, we'll straighten it out. Okay, folks, thank you. This was a great session. Here's a chance for your questions, for you to ask our experts what's on your mind. We've got a few minutes here at the end. You've heard some personal perspectives on this from Jason. You've heard certainly the medical perspectives from Dr. Um, Mendoza and now from Kim Cardins and the legal issues. I'm going to invite them up if they would please come up here. And then we're just going to share some uh, Q&A time with you, answer any questions you may have. By the way, just from a housekeeping standpoint, the presentation Dr. Mendoza shared, you're going to get that. We're going to send it out to you electronically, so after this event you'll, you'll get that information. So <coughs> let's go. Any questions? Uh, come on up, Jason. Any questions that uh, we can answer? Oh, we have a few hands. All right. Yes, um, does the sprayer work horizontally, or does it have to be vertical? It will always be horizontal, because always the person's going to be lying down, okay. so it will always work. Kim, our corporate attorney's question was, <laughs> now that there's an awareness um, campaign in the community, is there an employer liability for not having Narcan on site? I don't think so. It's unlikely. It's, it's really a good thing that you can do, but... It's kind of like if you don't have a first aid kit on site. If there's, you should have one that's really helpful. Um, you should have an AED like we have over here. But again, if you don't have one, it's unlikely to meet the standard for well, for negligence would probably be the the appropriate standard. So no. Uh, two questions. One for Kim and one for Dr. Dosa. Nicely done for both of you. Very very well done. Um, from a in the second chance perspective that you just talked about, Kim, at the end, are you aware of any local or national companies that have done a great job that you could suggest to employers to consider as a best practice as to how they came to grips with all the challenges that might be embedded in an employee who is tested positively is basically out the door, but we want to give them a second chance? Are there companies that have done a good job that you could reference so people can go and try to figure out how to do it? Um, I don't. I can't identify a specific employer who's really got their hands on this. I think addiction is really um, an individual. You want to be individual about each person and, and um, situation. I do think I've worked with a number of employers who, um, for instance, you know, my clients teach me probably more than I teach them. So drafting a drug policy for one of you know my hospital clients. They have people who are obviously are in safety sensitive positions and have access to medications. This was a really um, big issue for them. So we worked together and they were very aware of a number of people who had gone to treatment, come back and return to the workforce. They all, but for every person that is, you know, able to enter recovery, there's probably five more who are not. And I, I'll defer on the statistics there, but, um, but I don't think that there's a, a guaranteed successful program for anyone. It's really just trying to get as many people the benefit of the doubt or the second chance that we can to the extent that our, our workforces will allow. Thank you. My other question, Dr. Mendoza, is uh, whether I think of this as an employer, as a father or a grandfather, uh, and I'm retired so I no longer have the employer view, but uh, are there telltale behavioral or activity signs I'm trying to think about is my grandchildren who are once 15. What would I be expecting to see if somehow, God forbid, that child started to behave in a way that would tell me I want to get to them before they have an incident? How does, and I suggest that as a question for an employer too, watching their colleagues. You know, the, the challenge in answering that question is that so many people do the best that they can trying to identify, and it's still not perfect. And, you know, the one thing I'll say is that it's highly variable. You know, there are, you know, to the extent that you know your loved ones well, if you see a departure from their usual behavior, that's an opportunity to inquire a little bit more. But to say that they're always going to do this or that or the other thing, um, you know, I think we know enough stories of people who didn't follow the rules and still found themselves in trouble. You know, knowing, you know, knowing who their friends are, you know, all these things are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, talking to your, your your kids, you know, knowing about their employment, if you see them out late at night, if they're doing things that are just not like them. But, uh, you, know, you know, I hesitate to answer that question because it, it's, it's as though it could have been prevented all the time, and it's yeah. just not that easy. And I was looking for the simple 
We tell him. Because <laughs> what? The reason is because I did not realize that the pinprick uh, pupil apparently is unique to opioid addiction. It's it's I, there's very little else that can do I that at this age. age. So Mike, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Jason to weigh in on that too. He might have some insights. Well, I really, but uh, the doc said was pretty right on. But really, uh, there's nothing you can do. People get an itch, they're gonna scratch it uh, when they're young. And uh, <coughs> the, I've, I've got four sons, and uh, every day you're looking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking. You're talking there's the hate you're talking. But but I'll be staring at your eyeballs from now on. <laughs> you know what? Though? If the eyeballs are pinned, then you, you should know they're high. Yeah. But at, at that age, at 15, if they're if they're pinned there. Well, and consider, you know, from the employer perspective, that, you know, our employees are kind of our kids, right? Or at least I can think of at least a couple of partners who are like, this is my kid. You know, I, I have protected her into, throughout her career, and now, you know, I'm my own practicing attorney or whatever. But um, you have relationships with people. You're working with people every day. And so, you know, maybe they're not 15 anymore, maybe they're 35 or 50 or whatever the case is, but you know people's patterns and behaviors. And as someone, you know, having a number of unscheduled absences, which is out of character, are they missing things? Or, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on warning signs, but I think that there are a number of, of red flags that might kind of come forward where you have an opportunity to engage in dialogue with your employees. And I would encourage you to you know, explain this to your managers as well. What should be what should we be looking out for? Do you have someone who had perfect attendance for fifteen years and now is, you know, those are almost the easy ones yeah. to spot to you know, maybe there's another issue, what might it be, but can we train our managers? Can we do Narcan training at work so that, you know, everyone kind of understands that we're a workplace that's at the forefront of this. So we're running towards the end of our program. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. I did see a couple hands over over here. Yes. If mine's really quick. As far as FMLA goes, what documentation is needed for us to provide that it, like with HIPAA regulations? I'm just wondering, like, what? Yeah. So FMLA certifications are going to be the same across the board. You have the employee complete their certification form, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of general. I'm Kim Harding, and I'm requesting FMLA. Then the employer has a portion, and then the employee does the employee certification which would be filled out by their health care provider. So for substance dependence, it's going to be the same as every other FMLA certification that we see. Is there a way around that with, like, if I'm trying to get FMLA because my child is going through addiction and my child doesn't want to give me permission for that, like they don't want to sign the releases, does that kind of type? No, we need the doctor's certification. Okay. So, um, so they would have to release that. Right, so as an employer, if you're willing to provide FMLA without the certification, you certainly can do that, it's not required. Um, but if you have an employee requesting FMLA, they can't come forward and say, well, my, my kid doesn't want to do it. Um, kind of everyone has to be on the same page for that. But it, yeah, I'll just admit that. <laughs> Question, yeah. For those of you, probably Jason and Becca Mendoza, that has experience with um, some of these patients, if you have an employee that admits to stealing um, due to their addiction, is it, do you think that they have the best chance of, of beating the addiction if you just let them go and try to get them into treatment, or if you put them into the system and have them arrested for theft? So my belief is that we're not going to arrest our way out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our law enforcement partners are the first to tell you that. You know, we need to provide support for the people who are struggling through this. As a physician, you know, generally speaking, uh, I focus on their health. And all the circumstances around that, unless they're a threat to self or others, I focus on them and their health. And I hear all sorts of stories of things that I wish I didn't hear, but I focus on their health. And so I want to get them treatment, I want to see them uh, for where they are at in their life and what they're doing, and uh, get them the support from that way. And for me, you know, people are stealing for all of us. Um, if somebody came to me and told me it was because I'm an addiction, you know, you help them through it. Um, it's, you know, they're stealing from all of us. That's what people do. That's what employees do, you know. Whether it's this, that, or the other thing. Um, so if somebody admits to it, how can you, 
they're going to turn, turn them away or have them arrested. That I, I wouldn't. There was a question back here. To follow up on uh, Kim's comment about you know training more employees at work or supervisors, um, I know that you referenced the county website for a monthly training. Are there other groups, or would you work through Mineral County to have someone come on site if you had a significant number of people that could benefit from that? You're welcome, to, that you're welcome to reach out to us, uh, the U of R, Trillium. Okay. Uh, a number of organizations around the, the community are providing the training. But uh, from my standpoint, you know, what you went through today was sort of you know, second level training. We want everybody to get the first level training, which is a four minute video that, you can, that we're encouraging pharmacies to show when they give NARCAM. So you know, we want to decrease the barriers to, to minimal training. Do you know if any of the pharmacies like Wegmans, for example, do with that as any of their community work? Well, I know Wegmans is trying to work on that right now. Uh, I've got some uh, contacts at CBS and Rite Aid that are working on the same. But okay. you know, you know, reach out to me. You know, and I'll connect you with the resources. We you know there are a lot of great resources in this community. That we can work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So to that point, we've actually come to the end of our program. It's uh, it's nine thirty. Um, I hope our speakers will have a chance maybe to hang around for a few minutes. If there's any other unanswered questions from the group here, we'll. We'll try to address those for you. But to that last point, resources. There is help out there, right? Certainly the chamber. We're here to help you. If you have any issues or questions or concerns, you can give us a call. Kathy Richmond runs our HR services area, our HR helpline. She'd be more than happy to help uh, direct you in the right area. Um, I certainly would be more than happy to help you as well. We have a health care planning committee that's all over this issue. We have some members in the audience here. So we've got some expertise in-house. But as Dr. Mendoza said, there's a lot of information out there. There's the Monroe County website that, that is one uh, piece to it. There's other community agencies in town that are working on this. Certainly if it's a legal issue, you want to consult your counsel. So that will be the other side to it. But uh, again, I'd like to just thank our, our presenters today for doing such a great job explaining all these areas and answering our questions. So please <laughs> join And again, thank you to County Executive Cheryl Donalfo for her comments today, for Dr. Mike Mendoza, for Kim Harding, and for Jason DeLeo for joining us for this program. I hope you found this helpful. There are a few resources available even as you go out the door. So WXXI has uh, put together some great information. There's a flyer out there that you can look to. If you want the Narcan kit, uh, hopefully you will be taking them with you. Please leave the enrollment form and make sure you take that on your way out. Thanks again, and uh, have a great day.